But this morning, I'm delighted to welcome Professor Nyla Kabir, who is Professor of Gender and Development in the Department of Gender Studies and the Department of International Development at LSE. She'll be talking about the importance of effective evaluation of development initiatives over the longer term, concentrating particularly on a programme that, were, that ran in West Bengal, which gave asset transfers to women in extreme poverty. And at the end of this talk, we should be able to take a few questions via the chat. As time is tight, please do think of your questions as the talk's happening and type them in so that we can get straight to the questions at the end. But um, for now, I will hand over to Nyla. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much and uh, welcome to the LSE community. I'm very pleased to be able to share some of the work I do. And um, just a quick correction to what Louise said. It is about trying to do a long-term impact evaluation, both short-term and long-term, but really what, sharing with you what we didn't get right. Uh, so let me start by giving you a bit of background. This was a, a, a transfer program, uh, and I'll describe it, which is based on RAC, which is the Bangladesh, which is a big NGO in Bangladesh, which had experimented with uh, a multi-stranded pr productive safety net program for the extreme poor and targeting women in extremely poor households. Because we know that the poor are not a homogenous group, you know, we put them, may put them all below the poverty line, but there's a lot of difference amongst them, both in terms of how poor they are, but also in terms of their identity, location, and so on. So because the BRAC efforts seem to be relatively successful, nothing is fully successful, uh, a number of organizations, including the Ford Foundation and, and the World Bank's uh, consultative group for poverty, decided to try and pilot this approach in a number of different countries, mainly using randomized control trials. But we were a team that were asked to do at least two of these using more uh, qualitative um, methods of evaluation. So what is this uh, approach? The, the evaluation we carried out was in West Bengal, and therefore it, uh, the, the organization in West Bengal adapted it a little bit to their own you know, way of thinking. But essentially, it is transferring small productive assets, which would be livestock, poultry, fish, support for grocery shops, and so on, to women in extremely poor households to start up their own enterprises. Along with that, and the idea is to help them move out of extreme poverty, not out of poverty, but out of extreme poverty, over, you know, with the assistance that is provided over two years. So along with these assets, they were given monthly consumption stipends so they could focus on growing their assets and enterprises rather than having to run around looking for other ways to earn a living. In addition, in West Bengal, because of the kind of organization it was, it formed women into self-help groups. In other words, uh, in different villages, women came together and met on a monthly basis. They agreed to save a certain amount every month. They pooled their savings and they used these pooled savings to lend to each other uh, around livelihood issues. So it was controlled by them rather than, um, you know, uh, loans provided by the organization. There was some basic health support because, you know, health shocks are seen as a major reason why people plummet into even greater poverty. And very importantly, the staff of this organization um, provided intensive training and mentoring activities on a regular basis throughout the two year period. And by intensive training and mentoring, I mean that they were provided you know, with knowledge and skills around livelihoods, kind of livelihoods they would like to have access to, but also you know, discussed their problems, planning for the future, what was going wrong. So there was an intensive, you know, um, supportive, um, emotionally supportive element to this as well. So we, this went on, uh, the, the program we looked at started in November 2006 and ended in August 2009, so a, a longish period. We came in with our research, a team of us, and I've given references on the last slide, uh, for a period of a year, 2009 to 2010. And we used participatory wealth ranking and the help of the organization staff to select about 10 women that they regarded as relatively successful at doing quite well, since the program had been going on for a while, and 10 who were not supposed to be doing that well. We, our team, and we had someone resident in West Bengal, interviewed these women using life history methods uh, and bringing it right up to the current time. So some of the work was being done in real time. Um, and, and visited them, I think, uh, once every two months. 
and talk to them, to their families. And these were interviews that went on for an hour or two or three, as long as women were willing to speak, but also members of the family were willing to speak. One of the things we did on the very last interview, we asked them, since the program had been going on for a while, to think of a ladder of opportunities, you know, a graduation ladder, and tell us where on that ladder, where they had started out, which one, and where did they, uh, have they ended up. Now, clearly, this is a very subjective evaluation by the participants, but it, we tried to see whether this, you know, those who saw themselves as doing well, fitted with the way the organization had uh, classified them. And it provided us this, you know, fast climbers, slow climbers, with a useful device for discussion. So I want to start by telling you who these women were and to remind you what abject poverty can look like. These are amongst, you know, West Bengal is a quite a diversified population. And amongst the poorest groups are Dalits, the, the lowest castes, the so-called untouchable castes, the Adivasis or indigenous people who are the very poorest and the most marginalized and very poor Muslims. So this was the, uh, the kind of heterogeneity in terms of identity. And they were all, particularly the Adivasis, extremely poor. So a Dalit woman said, my family survived on wages. When we got hold of rice, we had no salt. When we got hold of rice, uh, salt, we had no rice. Uh, and other backward castes, what uh, the phrase from India, that if she was a beggar, so if I didn't bring enough arms, we ate the starch from the rice, and if I didn't bring any, any arms, then we starved. Or we lived on what my husband earned, when there was income from the shop, we ate. So these are people for whom food security was a major issue. And the Nadivasi women said, we were too poor to help each other. Everyone's condition was the same. There was no cultivation, we struggled to eat, we dug out edible roots of plants, we lived on whatever was available. We went crab catching in a nearby river, but how much could you get? We would keep a bit of money for ourselves, but it was not enough for the next day. So we are talking about people who start from conditions of extreme poverty, which reflected not only their lack of material assets, but also their marginalized identities and how they, they were regarded by the people around them and by the state. So let's look at how, who was it that seemed to do well in this particular project? Interestingly, it was the most marginalized group, the Adivasis, that reported themselves as doing well on the ladder and that the, the organization staff also said were doing well. And one of the reasons was they and some of the other Dalit women, they had worked all their lives, almost from childhood. They were accustomed to being out there and looking for a living, trying to earn a living. The Adivasis were numerically and politically unimportant. There was, there was no vote, you know, there were no vote bank for the politicians. So they had been bypassed in the past with every uh, effort and development. So when this project came along, offering them assets and so on, they seized this opportunity as a once in a lifetime opportunity. And they tried to follow almost everything that they were taught. They were very faithful. Uh, they were being taught about how to cultivate because they're not accustomed to settled cultivation, using particular rice techniques, how to look after cattle and so on. So that enthusiasm of the most marginalized group who had no other opportunity was one of the factors that led them to being quite uh, among the fast climbers. The other very important and interesting thing, which perhaps doesn't come out in very quantitative uh, evaluations, is the importance of intra-household relationships where household members worked together, whether that cooperation was imposed by a very autocratic head of household, or whether it was something voluntary and of nature of the relationships, where households pulled together and cooperated, but how, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the father or the husband might stay at home so that the woman could go out crab catching or looking after sheep. You know, that cooperation made a huge difference. But one thing we did find is that although there were some households that were very conflictual, that conflict seemed to decline over the life of the project. And we'll talk a little bit, I'll talk a little bit about why. Now, obviously, where there was an able-bodied earning male breadwinner, households did quite well. But if you had an able-bodied male irresponsible breadwinner, someone who actually uh, drained household resources by drinking or gambling or whatever, then actually not having a breadwinner at all was pretty, you know, could be a benefit. And so there were three women who were female household heads, no male breadwinners, but who seemed to benefit from the fact that there was no one stopping them, no one drinking up their pockets. So these three women actually made it quite well on their own. 
What about this one? The ones who didn't seem to do work so well, the slower climbers. These were women who had may have worked in the past, but there were major restrictions on their mobility, either because they were Muslims and therefore there were uh, norms around. Uh, amongst very poor Hindus, there are no norms of this kind. But amongst very poor Muslims, there are still norms about how uh, mobile you can be in the public domain. Or you had jealous husbands from any one of these groups who would not let their wives go out, who, um, you know, often one actually destroyed her assets because they were so angry about uh, the fact that they were not being given the assets or the wife was not trying to apply for, you know, uh, self-help group loans for them. Some of these households had high dependency ratios, but sometimes the dependents were adult men who either could not work or would not work. So dependency ratio doesn't mean that it's children, because children did go on to work amongst these very poor households. And then these households suffered from various disasters, which they were not able to cope with in the way that the fast climbers were. One other factor was that particularly Muslims in West Bengal, West Bengal has a much higher minority of Muslims than other states in India. I think about 27% of the population is Muslim, which makes them a very important vote bank which means that politicians have moved them and they are, live in villages where they have access to other opportunities. Unlike the Adivasis, small, numerically 5%, nobody cares. So what? So these were the two groups that, and so the unexpected finding was that the most marginalized group did relatively well and better than the others. So these were the groups and, and how did change happen? Well, interesting, Interestingly, the pathways through which change happened and the changes that happened, as you might expect, were very, you know, organically related. So we, I, I could identify four pathways. One is, of course, material, the fact that they got assets and consumption stipends, health support, savings through the self-help groups. Cognitive changes, pathways, what they learned from the training and, and uh, from the mentoring and from each other relational because of the interactions with staff on a regular basis and meeting through the self-help groups on a regular basis and subjective, how they felt about themselves and about others and their capacity to think of a better life for themselves. So here are some of the impacts that they reported. And we, we carried this out for the pilot between 2007 and 2009, we came in 2009. One of course was strengthening and deepening of the asset base. These are the positives, the ones who reported uh, major change. And of course, you know, they were able to use their, their assets to uh, generate a surplus to buy more assets and so on. Food security, they, they, would, they learned how to buy wheat and rice and stock up when prices were low, so they weren't having to buy when prices were high. Uh, they were told to cultivate any piece of land that they have, a small bit of uh, homestead land, cultivate you know, use the roof to grow vines, etc. So there was a real emphasis on maximizing what they had at their disposal. And of course, self-help groups meant that they had new possibilities for saving and lending to each other, uh, you know, amongst the peer group, and therefore they were less dependent on landlords and shopkeepers and getting into indebtedness. Diversification of livelihood options, they were able to use that. Some were just crab catching, some were just... Uh, wage labor, now they could combine wage labor with livestock rearing, with fishing. And that was very important because it meant that there was no time of the year when they weren't earning some kind of money. And this had to be taught. It was not something that they had thought of because they, you know, that issue of bandwidth, that you just don't have the time and the knowledge to think of what is possible. Improvement in household relations, and this was very much when you had certain violent husbands, uh, the staff, project staff would talk to them, you know, tell them that they bad for the family, bad for the women, you know, why are they doing this? And of course, a lot of it was frustration on their part and so on. But by the end of the project, a number of the women were. And then it makes you think that maybe, you know, we can deal with domestic violence through this ongoing interaction with people, but I don't know. And then, of course, they reported that they knew much more, that they now had ideas of their own. You know, it's my idea to to start, uh, you know, to swap goats for pigs because I'm a Dalit and I'm much more comfortable rearing pigs than the goats that the project has given me. And then there was the subjective changes. People talked about courage, they talked about um, uh, self-confidence, <clears throat> they talked about the capacity to aspire. <clears throat> As one woman said, we have to dream, but we dream within our limits. We try to have achievable dreams. 
those who didn't do too well, I told you, they didn't go out to work, their husbands were not cooperative. But nevertheless, there were two or three of these uh, impacts that they reported. Food security and lessening of debt. Saving that self-help group allowed them to save in a disciplined way, which is very difficult when you're poor and there's a temptation to use up whatever money you have. But by you know, handing it over to the group, it meant that, that those savings built up. There was some improvement in their household relations in some cases because they were now bringing in money and earning and so on, and improvement in health saving behavior. Ah, this was finished in 29, uh, 2009, 10. I go back to West Bengal as a part of another project, and I thought, I really want to know how those 20 people that we talked to went on, how they got on. Did the impacts that they reported at that time were those impacts, did they get sustained or did it you know, dissipate as the pilot ended? And fortunately, Sanchari Datta, who did all the interviews in the earlier phase, was very willing to come and work with me and do the interviews again with those uh, 20 people. One of them had died. One of them wasn't available. Uh, and she was working elsewhere, but we interviewed uh, 18. This is where we realized that, that a lot of change had taken place. First of all, uh, let me go back to that. First of all, the left government that had been in uh, West Bengal for 30 years had been replaced by Trinamool Congress, a very uh, Congress party. Agriculture was now much more productive, but fish farming had spread, and so there was less uh, wage labor. People were migrated out. Poverty had gone down. A microfinance organization had entered into the area. Sons had grown up and were now earning. Daughters had to be married off. A lot of change. And we realized that the limitations of our methodology then, because although we could go back and talk to people, while we do the earlier evaluation, it was a form of process tracking in real time. And so people were able to say, oh, this happened because of a project that happened. But to go back after, you know, eight or nine, seven or eight years and ask them, did this happen because of the project? It was far more um, difficult to get a sense. What, however, was interesting is amongst those who were the fast climbers, some still were doing well and better, some were not. Among those who didn't graduate very well, uh, they were benefiting from other resources and they were doing quite well. What I think was the lesson we learned was from how they recalled the project. And they talked about, uh, the ne those who were more negative about the project tended to talk about how they lost their assets, you know, their livestock died, their crops failed, they, uh, you know, the business they tried to start up didn't go anywhere. So a lot of it was in terms of the material um, losses that had happened, you know, out of the assets that they were given. And the loans had disappeared. The self-help groups did not last, did not live beyond the project. And so an important source of loans. And they, were, they didn't feel comfortable about taking loans from like finance because, you know, it's much more disciplined. But amongst those who gave positive uh, evaluations, a positive memory, it was the cognitive and subjective changes that had lasted, that they valued even now. As they said, we had planned to move along that you showed us, the track that you showed us. The project sheep died, but we had learned from sheep rearing, so we bought some more and we began again, expanding from two to 20. The advice you gave us, the savings and all that we should be doing, all of this has helped us, but we have had problems. Another said, we benefited from the ideas you gave us about the importance of saving out of what we had earned in order to help in times of stress. And someone said, if someone provides you with even a ladder, you can climb over the wall of poverty. But without that ladder of knowledge and so on, we could not have climbed. So what I think is that what was exceptional, unique, or distinctive about this BRAC approach was that by providing assets as well as uh, training and cognitive uh, you know, uh, capacity building and so on, what they did was brought together two different kinds of resources. And that combination of material assets and livelihood training became a form of practice-based learning over the two years. If you had had just assets without that intensive mentoring and livelihood training, they would have lost the assets, they wouldn't have known what to do. But if you had just given them livelihood training, you know, that's knowledge in the abstract. What, by combining these two, it was people were able to learn on the job, if you like, you know, learn from using these assets and making mistakes and so on. So let me just go back to a point that I was going to make. And that is very clear that when we look 
with these project interventions that they do not operate in a vacuum. The past history of the participants, the skills and experiences that they have been able to accumulate, and so those women who had been accustomed to working all their lives brought with them a form of human capability that was not available to women who had hardly ever worked. And they were able to accumulate this, and then with the present integration of resources and relationships that they were able to draw on, they brought all this to bear on how they responded to the kinds of support that they were given. And what was very interesting is that the ladders that were woven, constructed by the most successful amongst them, were not based on any one single livelihood activity, because no one single livelihood activity pays them enough to take them through the whole year. Rather, they wove together different kinds of activities, often to exploit complementarities and synergies between them. Um, so they would use, you know, the dung from uh, animals to as fertilizer for the fish. Uh, they would use, uh, you know, profits from selling their vegetables to invest in their, their, in their cultivation and so on. So complementarities and synergies between different kinds of activities, diversifying the sources and timing of income flows, using profits from one to capitalize the other, ensuring that services during busy season could be tidied, used to tide them over to unemployment and using whatever um, resources. So when I think back on it, what it was about was about, you know, thinking about timing of things, thinking about relationships between things. And I think that was a lesson that was fortunate that this organization staff was able to communicate. So I'm going to end in a minute, but let me just, there was a documentary made by my colleague Gautam Sen, who had been there at the start of 2006 and who had taken a, done a short video of six of the people who were participants. So when we went back in 2019, I asked him to revisit those six people. So there is a film about them. And what these two pictures are showing, I should not be in 2007. And what it's showing is the kind of food she was able to eat in 2019. Whereas people were eating wild creams in 2007, and the film is called Fit Rice and Fish Curry, because for a Bengali, that is the ideal meal, you know, to have rice and fish curry. So that was what they were able to eat. And this is a Jamuna, who was a, 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 a Adivasi woman. And what we can see there is the, the housing, the way, the way the housing was built. So I think the film is very interesting because it, um, you know, uses the wrong word to talk a little bit about how they had thought about the project in 2007, when they had no idea what was going to happen, how they thought about it in 2019, they got it back right. And these are some of the references that you might be interested in. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. And yes, we have a couple of minutes for questions. If anyone has one, please do put them in the chat. Um, did you want to say something, Nina, about, um, I've included the link to the paper that you wrote about randomised control trials not yes. being the gold standard. Do you yes. want to mention that? Well, I, I got sort of caught up in the argument about randomised control trials for the simple reason that where we were doing our qualitative evaluation, about a 100 kilometres down the road, there was a randomised control trial being carried out on a pilot of the same project, the same approach, but uh, using a randomized control trial method and uh, using a microfinance organization rather than a self-help group organization. And so the paper that I posted actually talks about why I think randomized control trials need to be far more embedded in the context, pay far more attention to causality. There are questions, there are impacts of theirs that we can answer from our project because we were doing it in the same area. You know, we can answer why half of the project participants that were chosen as a treatment group dropped out of the project, did not complete the project, did not accept free assets. So we can answer all these things because we worked ourselves with people, we listened to people, and we were very familiar with the context. So I think what I've tried to do in that paper and in some of the, uh, the other links is talk a little bit about different ways of assessing change. If we want to understand change, we don't just want to understand what worked. We want to understand how it worked, why it worked, who it worked for. Because no intervention ever has an identical impact in every context. And we need to understand what differentiates this impact if we are going to make the most of the intervention. Great, thank you. And 
Oh, one question quickly then. I like the idea of ladders out of poverty. You found that most were doing better years later when children had grown up and could contribute. What are your ideas for strategies at the point when a family has a high dependency ratio? Um, well, the people at the, at the start of the project in 2007 had extremely high dependency ratios. Uh, what the project allowed them to do is, no, sorry, they didn't have high dependency ratios because children were working, okay? So the ratio of earners to uh, people who were not working at all tended to be quite high. What the project did is allowed them to increase their dependency ratios because they now were able to send their children to school. So I think when we're thinking about these dependency ratios, uh, we need to ask, what is the nature of the dependency? Is a child a dependent because the child is at school? Or is the child a dependent because they're at home and they're not able to do anything? Is, is the dependency ratio low because a child is working? So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but uh, these families had to struggle at an early stage of their household life course when children were still very young and when a lot of the, the men were not working. Great, thank you. I am conscious of time because we've only got a couple of minutes and I know you have to get to a seminar. So we'll probably wrap up there and 